Chapter Twenty Seven of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twenty Seven, Trouble. When Kate returned to Coombe Cellars, she saw that some trouble had occurred. Her aunt was sitting at the table in tears. Pasco had planted himself on the settle, with his legs stretched before him, wide apart, the soles turned up, and his hands in his pockets. His hat was on, and he was whistling a tune, a strain out of Jackson's T. Dumb, in unconcern. Kate had heard enough of the altercations between her aunt and uncle to be aware that their circumstances were strained, and that Zira disbelieved in her husband's business capacities. Pasco had himself admitted to her, on the drive from Brimps, that he was in difficulties. Zira, so far from refraining from her comments before Kate, hailed her entrance as an opportunity for renewing her anim adversions on Pasco. "'Look here, Kitty. Here is what we have come to. Read that. Your uncle, like a reckless fool, has gone and bought wool when there is no sale for it, and has given a bill for it which has expired. The bank has returned it to Coker, dishonored. Dishonored! Do you hear that, Pasco?' and here is Coker, furious and demanding immediate payment. On the other side, there's the Tynemouth coal merchant threatening proceedings. What is to be done? Kate looked at her uncle. Don't be excited and angry, Zira, said he, with the utmost composure. After rain comes sunshine. It is darkest before dawn. When the tide is at lowest ebb, it is on the turn to the flow. "'But what is to be done? "'Dishonored!' exclaimed Zira. "'Dishonored? "'A fiddlesticks. "'The bill is returned. "'That is all. "'The money will come. "'Whence? "'Can you stamp on the ground "'and make the coin leap up? "'Can you throw your net into the tine "'and gather guineas as you can shrimps? "'It will come right,' said Pasco. "'There is no need for this heat, I tell you. "'I have seen Farmer Pook and he will advance me five hundred pounds. Yes, on the security of this house. Well, what of that? Five hundred pounds will not suffice to meet all the claims. Well, there are Kitty's hundreds. They shall not be touched. You promised me the loan of them, did you not, Kitty? asked her uncle, scarcely raising his head to look at her. Yes, you are heartily welcome to them, said the girl. "'They shall not be touched!' exclaimed Zira, leaning her fists on the table. "'That is as Jason thinks and chooses,' answered Pasco. "'He is trustee for Kitty, not you. "'He got me into the hobble, and he must get me out.' "'What? Did he get you into this about the wool?' "'I should have managed about the wool, were it not for the brimps business.' "'And the coals?' asked Zira, ironically." I can manage well enough when not drawn away into foreign speculations. Jason persuaded me against my will to embark in this timber business, and that is it which is creating this obstruction. He got me in, he must get me out. Kate's a good girl, she helps, and don't rate and rant as you do, Zira. I don't say she is not a good girl, retorted Zira. What I say is, you are a bad uncle to desire to rob her, rob her. I ask only a loan for a few weeks. Her money, and that from Pook, will set us on our feet again. At that moment, the man just alluded to came in with much noise. His face was red, his expression one of great anger, and without a greeting, he roared forth, This is an insult. The girl is an idiot. She has refused him. Him. A Pook. Who? What? asked Zira, letting go the table and staggering back, overcome by a dreadful anticipation of evil. Who? What? retorted Pook, shaking his red face and then his great flabby hand at Kate. She, Kitty alone, has said no to my John. Zira uttered an exclamation of dismay. Pasco's jaw fell, and, 
drawing in his feet, he pulled his hands from his pockets and leaned them on the arms of the settle, to be ready to lift himself. She, that chit, has dared to refuse him, roared Pook. Not that I wanted her as my daughter. Heaven defend! I think my John is worth better girls than she. But that she should have refused him, my John, she who ought to have gone down on her knees and thanked him if he gave her a look, that she should have the impudence, the, the, he choked with rage. Now, not one penny of mine shall you have, not on note of hand, on no security of your beggarly house, a cockle and winkle eating tea house. Bah! Not a penny! Then he turned, snapped his fingers at Sarah and Pasco, and went out. There ensued a dead hush for some moments. Kate had turned very white, and looked with large, frightened eyes at her uncle, then at her aunt. She felt that this was but the first puff of a storm which would break in full force on her head. Pasco stumbled to his feet, planted his right fist in the hollow of his left palm, and, coming up close to Kate, said hoarsely, "'You won't have him. You—you you frog in a well. You won't have him, the richest young chap in Coombe. I say you shall have him. You shall run after Mr. Pook, and say it is all a mistake. You shall take Jan thankfully.' You only say no, just out of bashfulness. You did not think yourself worthy. Tell him you said no because you thought Jan was asking you against his father's wishes. Say that now you know how the old man feels. You gratefully accept. Do you hear? Run. Kate did not move. Her head had fallen on her bosom when he began. Now she raised it and, looking at her uncle steadily in the face, she said, I cannot. I have told Jan my reasons. Reasons? Indeed! Precious reasons! What are they? Kate did not answer. Her reasons were such as Pasco could not understand. Kate, interposed Zira in an agitated voice, what is the meaning of this? Oh, dear aunt, it is true. I cannot take Jan. I have refused him, and I cannot, will not withdraw the no. In this matter I alone am answerable, and answerable to God. I insist, stormed Pasco. I cannot obey, answered Kate. Cannot, will not obey us who have brought you up. I suppose next you will refuse to obey your father? In this matter, yes, if he were to order me to take Jan Pook. I'll force you to take him. You cannot do that, uncle. She spoke with composure, whereas he was in a towering passion. Look at this, said he, snatching up the letter from the table. I am dishonored now, indeed, as Zira says. If you take Jan, all is well. The old father will find me money, and all runs on wheels. You put in your spoke, and everything is upset. Dishonored, ruined, beggared, and all through you. He beat down his hat over his brows, laughed wildly, and shook his fist at Kate. I was chucked out of the trap t'other day. I wish I had broken my neck sooner than come to this. I've nourished a viper in my bosom, and now it turns and stings me. Leave her to me, said Zira. You make matters worse by your violence. That is the way with you men. Leave her to me. Pasco flung himself back into the settle, and thrust out his legs as before, and rammed his fists into his pockets. Before he had held his chin up, now it was buried in his shirt front. Then Zira pulled her niece into the window. Kate drew a long breath. She knew that now came the worst trial of all. Kitty, said the aunt, holding both the girl's arms and looking into her face. Are you utterly heartless? Is it a matter of no concern to you that we should be ruined? You have but to run after Mr. Pook, and all will be well. 
why should you not give way to my wishes and those of your uncle? What have you against the lad? He is good, and he is rich. I do not love him, answered Kate, confusedly. But he is so well off. There is no one with half his prospects in the place. I cannot understand. He likes you. He is desperately fond of you. I will never take one I do not love, said Kate, shaking her head. And you have heard the condition we are in. Your uncle owes money on all sides. If money is due him, he cannot recover it. He has sold the farm. There remains only this house. If he sells that, we are without a home. Then where will you be? Come, yield to our wishes, child. I cannot. Indeed, I cannot, answered Kate, trembling in all her limbs. I would have taken Jan if I could. What is to prevent you? Kate was silent. There is... There can be no one else in the way, pursued Sira. Again, no answer. Stubborn and hard-hearted, that is what you are, said Zira bitterly. It is all the same to you what becomes of us. We reared you. We have loved you. I have been to you as a mother. You have never shown either your uncle or me that you are grateful for what we have done for you. Your own father you treat as though he were a dog. You take no notice of him. I have heard of hearts of stone. I never believed in them before. I do now. No. There is. There can be no one else so insensible. You have not got it in you to love anyone. Kate sighed. The tears ran down her cheeks. Dear aunt, I have always loved you, and I love you now, and ever will. Then show me that you have a heart, said Zira. Words without deeds are wind. If my own dear child Wilmot had been alive, this would not have happened. Jan would have loved her, not you. And even if she had not cared for him, yet, when she knew my wishes, she would have yielded. She would have given her heart's blood for me. Kate pressed her folded hands to her bosom. Her heart was bursting with pain. What is it that I ask of you, pursued Zira, and brushed the tears from her own eyes. Nothing but what is for your own advantage, your own happiness. How will you like starvation, rags, no roof over your head? If you take Jan Pook, you will become the first woman in the place. You will have money to do with as you likes. Jan is a good-hearted fellow. Never have you heard of his having wronged man, woman, or child. He is amiable. You can turn him round your little finger. What more can a woman wish for? Kate's mind was tossed with trouble. She had so often longed that the opportunity might arise for her to prove to her aunt that she loved her. Now the occasion had come. The future was full of threat and disaster, and one word from her might avert this and restore serenity. And not only would that one word relieve her uncle and aunt in their present distress, but it would also suffice to make poor, unworthy Jan a happy man. But that word she could not speak. She could not prevail with herself to speak it. She liked John Pook, but for one thing she perhaps might have yielded. That one thing was that she had met with a man very different from the young yeoman, one who could answer questions and satisfy her hungry mind. I cannot, dear auntie. Cannot? What stands in the way? Who stands in the way? I cannot, auntie. Perverse, headstrong, heartless child. When luck comes to you, you throw it away and cast your own self and all belonging to you into misery. I wish you had never come here. I wish I had never nursed you in my arms, never cared for you as a child, never watched over you as a grown girl. Auntie, away, I will not speak to you again. End of chapter 27